In November 2001 in Columbia, Missouri, a sports editor was found brutally beaten and strangled in the car park of his workplace. With little forensic evidence and no leads, the case went cold. Until two years later, when a teenager claimed responsibility for the crime and in the process implicated one of his friends. Both were subsequently imprisoned for murder, but had the right men been convicted or had there been a miscarriage of justice? This is what happens when a prosecutor will do whatever it takes to win, regardless of the cost. This is the case of Ryan Ferguson. Now, before we get on with today's true crime video, I want to tell you about Island Quest Away. It's a new game that me and the family have been playing. It's already got loads of really positive reviews and there are reasons why. So first of all, if you like a bit of an adventure, the game starts with a shipwreck. Emily's the main hero, a bit like my name, Emily. So obviously, great name for a hero. Sails to the island with her assistant, Harrison. I'm gonna say now, Harrison does not shut up isn't good at taking on half the weight of any situation, just throwing it out there early on. Anyway, she sails to the island with her assistant and Harrison is actually a smuggler. She's met him during her journey in search of her brother who's just mysteriously disappeared. Now on the island, Emily meets lots of mysterious locals, finds artifacts of ancient civilizations and deals with a lot of puzzles. If you like puzzles, You'll love this. You get to explore the island with Emily in order to find her missing brother. You get to solve all the mysteries on the island and you get to collect ancient treasures. Now, what I love about this is there are loads of breathtaking locations where there are traps, there are riddles, and even, no, actually, I'm not gonna tell you. You need to download it to actually find out more. In addition to all of this, you and Emily will get to rebuild the farm together. You'll get to grow vegetables, start your own production, and you'll be able to make this place as cozy as you wish. This is basically my altar life where I do own a farm and lots of rescue animals and I grow vegetables. Just look at how you can decorate the farm. By the way, the game regularly offers events with unique decorations. You can even get a cute pony. Who does not want a cute pony? I know I want several. As I said earlier on, the only thing that grates on me a little bit is Harrison. He just keeps chatting instead of helping Emily with the workload. Does anybody else know somebody like that in their life? And if they end up getting together, I will be outraged. Now, if you already play Island Quest Away, please leave a comment on what you think about Harrison. Hmm. Join me in my judgy belief system. And if not, then why are you not? Download the game using my link in the description box or scan the QR code and get an impressive pack of 20 diamonds, 150 coins, and 230 energy points. What's not to like about that? With all this stuff that I'm handing over to you, how could the game be any more exciting? Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. Today's case, I hope will leave you with righteous rage about how systems can fail and how authorities can be corrupt. It is one of those cases that when I heard about it and read into it, I really couldn't believe what I was seeing, what I was reading, and also what I was experiencing. Because I'm a parent, I have young men who I have born, and the reality is the idea that they could be placed in a situation and have their freedom taken away from them when many of the things that these decisions are based on are not necessarily based in truth and are certainly not based in law. It's disconcerting and scary, and I think anybody out there who imagines that the authorities are always there to take care of us, when you hear about cases where that just simply isn't the case, it really is troubling. 
If you are new to my channel and you're thinking, why is she rambling on? I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. It's always crime related. It's always deep dive orientated. So if you like crime and consistency, please do come here on a Wednesday and a Sunday every single week for the rest of your lives. Well, maybe the rest of my life maybe the rest of both of our lives. Who knows? Let's get on with today's case. I'm going to take you back to the 31st of October 2001. So it's Halloween. And you can imagine on Halloween, particularly in America, it's a big deal. Lots of partying going on. If you're a young person, it's going to be an exciting time. And that night, 17-year-old high school junior Ryan Ferguson, he's going to a party at a friend's house in Columbia, Missouri. But when he arrives there and he's driven there in his car, everyone is basically in the process of leaving because the joy and fun police have arrived to disperse the party. Apparently there'd been a disturbance and people weren't happy about the noise and the party ends up getting broken up. Understandably, for Ferguson, this is not an ideal scenario. At the end of the day, you're going out, you want to have a party and you find out that the place that you're going isn't going to be able to provide that and you're looking for entertainment, shall we say, elsewhere. And he just happens to spot his childhood friend, 17-year-old Charles Erickson. He's known as Chuck. Now, Ferguson does not want the night to end because it hasn't even begun for him at this point. So he suggests to Erickson that they meet up with his older sister. So she's at a club having fun. She also has some IDs that her brother and his friend can actually borrow to get in. Don't deny it. We've all been there with our fake IDs. I actually used to have quite an industrious little business in creating fake IDs back in the day. I did. Meet me at the interchange where the buses come and I'll provide you with them as long as you've given me one of those passport photos. Not even joking. The amount of people who joined the humanist party in our area skyrocketed when I was involved. It's going back a long time. I didn't have a lot of money. I needed to think about ways of ingratiating me with the local teenage population, whilst also being able to pay for the odd trip out. So this is what they do. They travel downtown to the By George's Club and they go ahead and meet Ferguson's sister. Night's going great. They have several drinks in the time that they're there. They're having fun. And Ferguson's sister's very generous as well. Not only did she provide them with fake IDs, she also buys them a few drinks. It's what a good big sister does. And by the end of the night, Erickson was really heavily intoxicated. In addition to drinking the alcohol, he'd also been taking cocaine. And on top of that, he was taking the prescription drug Adderall. For those of you who don't know what Adderall is, it's used to treat ADHD. So... There's quite a heavy mix and a heady mix of different potential ingredients going through his body and certainly affecting his brain. Now, Ferguson and Erickson, they leave the bar around 1am. This is after they've run out of cash. But even though they've been having fun and now they're heavily intoxicated, apparently Ferguson doesn't want the night to end, wants to do something else. So he suggests to Erickson that they find someone to rob so they can get some more beer money. I know what you're thinking. Seems like a bit of an escalation for a Halloween evening. But apparently his friend agrees and Ferguson then takes a tyre iron from his car and the pair begin wandering the streets looking for a suitable victim. Kind of sounds like something out of some kind of B-grade Halloween movie plot, doesn't it? Anyway, in the meantime, we have 48-year-old Kent Heitholt. He's finishing work. Now, he was a sports editor at Columbia Daily Tribune, and he was a really well-loved individual for lots of great reasons. So he was a really hardworking man. He was a friendly family man, a real gentle giant is how his colleagues actually described him. And the mark of somebody you can describe for lots of different reasons. But you know what I'm like, guys? I love animals. Often they make star appearances whilst I am doing these particular videos. And I know that human beings don't have to love animals to be good people. But personally, I think if you are somebody that thinks about the more vulnerable beings in our world, it says something about your soul. And he had food in his car all the time so that he could feed the stray cats outside the office. And to me, that just demonstrates the empathy and compassion of this man. Like I said, it's hard to describe and get across in these videos, 
the mark of the human and also the meaning of that person because obviously every single human being is just infinitely priceless to the people who love them but there's just this additional feature where this man is concerned and he genuinely seems to care about everybody and everything now he had been working really late into the early hours that particular day so he logged off for his computer around 2 a.m in the morning and then he basically goes out into the buildings pretty small car park. It's about 2, 10 a.m. at this moment in time. Here he ends up chatting to a colleague. This colleague is part-time sports writer Michael Boyd, and they're chatting about work. This is about till 2.20 a.m. in the morning. But what he didn't know at that moment in time was it is actually being watched. So Ferguson and Ericsson are hiding down an alley behind this industrial bin, and they're watching us Kent said his goodbyes to Michael, watched him walk to his vehicle, unlock the front door, and then as he's shuffling some papers, preparing to obviously get the car sorted to go home, Ericsson and Ferguson run up behind him. Now, Kent was six foot five and 300 pounds. This is not an easy robbery victim. In fact, if you consider an opportunistic robbery let's just go there psychologically because what we know about people who wish to partake in crime they look for quite specific details in a potential victim usually they look for somebody who's relatively vulnerable obviously available and desirable now if i am going to go and rob somebody and I'm looking for a victim that fits that, shall we say, MO for me. And I'm going to consider that I can take that person on. I don't know. I'm just going to throw it out there at this moment in time. But six foot five and 300 pounds, not going to be on my list. Because at that size, I'm just going to throw it out there. They are going to be an opponent that I am not going to wish to take on. They're not an easy robbery victim at all. Now, of course... It suggested that he was attacked from behind and therefore if you're attacked from behind you essentially don't stand a chance no matter what size you are. I'm just highlighting that if you don't necessarily know exactly how something's going to play out are you going to go for somebody of that size? In this case apparently so. Now Ericsson repeatedly hits him with the tyre iron until he falls to the ground then he drops the iron actually near to Kent's motionless body. But the attack isn't over at that point, no. Ferguson then takes Kent's belt off him and strangles him with it. So this brutal, violent attack. Also, interesting type of attack for a random stranger to carry out in a robbery, particularly strangulation with a belt. On a personal level, that doesn't sit very well with me. I don't know about you guys, but certainly that is an unusual method of killing for somebody in a random robbery. Now, it's around this time that this horror is playing out that Shauna Aunt, who's a caretaker at the Tribune building, she goes outside to have a cigarette. And in the gloom, she can notice two shadowy figures that seem to duck down behind Kent's parked car. And she's pretty suspicious of this. This is not normal activity to see in the car park. So she goes straight back in, goes and gets her supervisor, Jerry Trump. Meanwhile, continuing with the robbery plan, Ferguson's apparently searching Kent's pockets. He takes his watch, takes his car keys. Ericsson then picks up the tyre iron from where he dropped it, along with the belt that Ferguson's used to strangle Kent and take it away. And so as they're leaving the scene, Jerry exits the building with Sean because she's informed him of something odds going on. He sees his body lying on the ground and shouts, I see you there. Who's out there? So walking away at this point, Ericsson calls back, somebody's hurt man. Jerry, which at this moment in time would be feeling like he'd entered a whole new dimension because this does not happen at work. This is a popular paper. This is not an occasion that he ever thinks he's going to be dealing with. He ends up walking over to the body and immediately recognises that it's Kent. And even more troubling, recognises that Kent has been seriously assaulted even more so. He's totally unresponsive. So Jerry tells Shauna, call 911, and that call is made at 2.26 a.m. Now, another sports writer, Robert Thompson, he's alerted that someone's 
been hurt in the car park. So he goes to check and he finds Kent lying face down on the concrete in a pool of blood. The first thing he does is turn him over, checks for a pulse. There's absolutely nothing. But what he notices straight away is there's red marks on his neck and they are consistent with ligature marks. Also, he notices a pile of cat food on the wall near to the car park. So again, Kent had been leaving food for the stray cats. It's just heartbreaking to imagine that while somebody was malevolently thinking about ending this man's life, he was thinking about sustaining the life of the local stray cats. Now, the police are called and the paramedics are called and they arrive to the scene. There's literally nothing they can do to save Kemp. He had suffered really severe blunt trauma injuries to his head. Also, he'd been asphyxiated and the autopsy later on revealed that he'd been severely beaten with a blunt object. They said he'd been struck at least 11 times about the head and about the neck. But the main cause of death, the thing that had ended his life was the asphyxiation. It was a strangulation. The hyoid bone had been fractured. They also noted that there were defensive injuries to the hands. So he'd obviously recognized that he was being attacked and he tried to defend himself. And due to the nature of the assault and the fact that he had a lot of injuries, it was actually established that it would have taken between six and eight minutes to carry out the killing, which is just a heinous and terrifying and devastating amount of time for any family member to know a loved one struggled for. Because six to eight minutes is an absolute lifetime when you're dealing with that kind of sustained attack. Now, the police are obviously desperate to figure out who has murdered this man because no one has an issue with this individual. This is so outside of what we can expect occurring to a person like this man, this well-loved individual who works hard, is well-respected and cares for everybody. The problem is, like with so many attacks that seem totally random and unexpected, where there aren't individuals seemingly known to people who would want to do somebody harm, it makes it really problematic for leads. So the police really struggle and they're trying their best, but the leads are just not coming in. Even worse, there isn't any forensic evidence particularly that's been left at the scene. Look, there was a single bloody hair strand that was found in the victim's hand. So that's ideal if you have a database that can bring up that particular individual. They also actually found some fingerprints on his car, but when they lifted these, just didn't match any of the police records that were available. So they couldn't pin anybody to that crime. They also found bloody footprints at the scene along with the blood covered buckle to Kent's belt that was lying close to his head. Now, this had obviously come off when he'd been being strangled because you can imagine that would be something that'd be quite violent and there would be some resistance certainly from Kent when he was trying to fight these individuals off. Now, what the investigators did have was Shauna and Jerry's description of these two college-aged men. Shauna actually informed the police that she did manage to get a really good look at one of the attackers because he'd spoken to her before walking away. Now, from her account and description, along with the artist sketch of the suspect, they released that to the public, but it didn't bring anything forward. So the case ultimately went cold, which is just harrowing for the family. At the end of the day, when you lose somebody that you love and is precious to you, the one thing that you want to know is that justice has been served. And to be sitting there and thinking there are literally no leads in this case, there is a chance that my loved one will never gain justice as they deserve. It must be blindsiding and horrifying and a constant nightmare to live with him. Meanwhile, of course, we have Ferguson and Erickson who just get on with their lives as if nothing has happened. That said, to be fair, Erickson had been so intoxicated he couldn't actually recall anything that had happened that night. So the pair go on to graduate high school. They go to two separate colleges. Erickson ends up attending one close to his home in Columbia. And Ferguson ends up moving two hours away to Kansas City. But then we have Erickson, two years after the incident, looking at a news report on the murder. And with that news report, is a police sketch of the suspect that investigators are looking for. Erickson immediately thinks, I look like that suspect. 
that suspect, that description, that artist's sketch looks like me. He also thinks to himself, well, hang on, the crime scene that evening, that was where Ferguson and I were partying in downtown Columbia. And then according to Erickson, he starts to have these really vivid dreams about the killing. And before long, he starts to hook on to the idea that he might have been involved, but that he couldn't actually remember the finer details because he'd been so intoxicated. So he ultimately goes up to Ferguson, this is at a New Year's Eve party in 2003, and he expresses these concerns to him, asks if they'd been the ones who were responsible for Kent's murder. Ferguson says, absolutely not, assures him that's not the case at all, but it doesn't allay Erickson's fears. In fact, those concerns just grow. Now in the end, he says that Ferguson threatens to kill him if he speaks to the police about him. Now bear in mind if that's the reality of what he's experiencing and he believes that they've already been responsible for a murder that he can't quite recollect but fears he may have been involved in, well he's going to be worried about Ferguson's potential promise to harm him. So these fears do not disperse and as the days and the weeks pass, Erickson actually becomes more and more and more convinced that they'd killed Kent. Ultimately, it gets too much for him, so he ends up confiding in a friend called Art Figura. Clearly, his friend Art is really alarmed. He's being confided in about a potential slaying of an innocent man. So Art ends up speaking to his friend, Nick Gilpin. And Nick can't contain that. Nick knows this is not acceptable. If this has been played out and they are responsible for murder, the authorities need to be informed. So he gives details of the conversation to Columbia police. At this point, understandably and rightfully so, Erickson is brought in for questioning. And it's not long before the horrific events of that night were outlined to detectives by Erickson. He gave a signed confession to Kent's brutal murder and robbery. Furthermore, he described the role that his friend, his childhood friend Ferguson, and his accomplice in this crime played in that particular commission of the killing. Now, although two years have passed by this point, Ferguson's past was about to catch up with him. I think he hit him all together. Just once. Just the once. The only problem I have with that is I know that he was hit more than once. Right? Like I just hit him once. You just hit him once. You didn't hit him more than no. Like because 10 I times. distinctly remember the first time that I hit him. I remember hearing this noise and it just and just seeing his face and it just made me sick. If you only hit him once, turn away and got sick. You had to hand the thing off to Ryan because this guy's got head wounds all over his head. We're talking minimum 15 strikes. I must have done it then. I mean, I don't know okay. if he did that or I stopped and he did it, I don't know. Did you ever drop the pipe? Probably. Did you hand it off to Ryan? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Let's go back to when you were talking about how you saw Ryan strangle this guy. Now, we know what the guy gets strangled with. That's kind of the thing I've been holding back from you. Uh -huh. All right. Is it possible that you know what he was strangled with and just didn't want to tell me? Because I, I know. I, it no, was. like I think it was a shirt or something. Or yeah, well, I know it wasn't a shirt. Like uh, maybe a bungee cord or I don't something from his car. I don't okay. see why he'd have a rope in his car. Well, we know for a fact that his belt was ripped off of his pants and he was strangled with his belt. Really? Yeah. Do you see a belt in Ryan's hand? Something look like a rope, maybe, or a bungee cord? I don't know. So it's possible Ryan could have strangled this guy with his belt. You got the keys and you not well, the guy is the man's belt? Yeah. His own belt? Yes. Does that ring a bell? Not at all. Like, I didn't. But you saw Ryan strangling him. I thought, yeah. Yeah, okay. You said earlier something about Ryan's, Ryan wanted to choke him down to make sure he was dead. Is that true? I think that he was like, yeah. We get to the 10th of March, 2004, and the police travel to Kansas City. They're after a murderer. They're finally going to bring somebody to justice who's evaded justice for years. They're finally going to give closure to a family desperate for answers. Now, Ferguson at this point is enjoying his freshman year at college. It's a complete shock to him when he's arrested, when he's charged with Kent's murder. 
Now, despite his accomplice telling investigators the full story, the whole story, Ferguson flat out refuses to admit his role in the killing. Says, I had nothing to do with it. Said his friend was mistaken. He said, look, we stayed in the By George Club until it closed. We hung around in the car park for around 10 minutes. We were talking to my sister. Then I drove Ericsson home and then I went home myself. Now, despite hours, and I mean hours of interrogation, forceful interrogation, shall we say, he maintained he was innocent all the way throughout here. It didn't shift. Now, Ferguson, when it came down to his plea, he pled not guilty to the charges of first degree murder and robbery. At this point, though, the case proceeds to trial. I did not do anything. I did not see anything. But and I'm here for murder. Like, I didn't do shit. Chuck says that he got kind of sick to his stomach after he hit this guy. During that time, uh, he looks over and sees you on top of the, the guy who's down and you're choking him out. He says strangling. You, you believe this? I, I, I believe Chuck probably had something to do with it. Well, he you says it's there. All right, well, I mean, he could have very well have been a part of it. I'm not. You were calm as hell when we come down there. We started talking about the murder. You're like, I didn't do it. I wasn't there. I don't know what you're talking about. The police pulled me and said, we were talking about a murder. I'm going to be getting about half crazy. I am f***ing half crazy, dude. I'm sorry I'm good at f***ing hiding my emotions. I'm shaking like a f***ing leaf here. I didn't do anything. I'm about to get in trouble for something I didn't do. Now, in the interim, prosecutors end up offering Erickson a plea deal. We all know prosecutors love a plea deal, don't they? You tell all of the stuff that we want you to tell about the other person that we think's guilty, and you'll get a better deal. So you just want me to basically say whatever you want me to say about the other person that basically would suggest it minimizes me being involved and maximizes them being involved. That's like absolutely A1. You've interpreted that absolutely correctly. But that's what they do. We know this, we've seen it, we will see it again. So yeah, if you plead guilty to first degree robbery, second degree murder and armed criminal action, you'll get 25 years. Now bear in mind, the other possibility for this guy is he gets convicted of first degree murder, receiving a life sentence after the trial. So that is not exactly a difficult one to decide on. Do I want 25 years where I can go out and live, you know, a relatively long life outside of incarceration? Or do I chance the jury and basically acknowledge the fact that that jury is going to hear me confessing to it all and then chance being locked up for the rest of my life? You're going to take the plea deal every single day of the week. And that's exactly what Erickson does. So now we have Ferguson's trial. Bear in mind, he said, I'm not guilty. This commences on the 14th of October, 2005. And in accordance with the plea deal, Erickson obviously takes the stand, testifies against his friend. He tells the court that he and Ferguson had robbed and had murdered Kent. He describes how he hit Kent with the tire iron and also how Ferguson then went on to strangle him with the belt. And he said that he put his foot on Kent's back, pulling back on the belt to give it more tension. Now, in addition to what can only be described as horrifically damning evidence against Ferguson, which has been provided by Erickson, there's also other incriminating testimony. So the caretakers at the Tribune building, Shauna Ort and Jerry Trump, they come forward. Now, it's interesting at this moment in time that when Jerry is giving this information, he's actually incarcerated. He's been in prison due to an unrelated sex offence. So he tells the court on the night of the killing, he'd basically got a really good look at the perpetrators. Now, after going into prison in 2003 for this unrelated sex offence, his wife had sent him a newspaper. Now, this newspaper end up having a report on Kent's murder and also the two suspects who were in custody. Jerry, reading this and seeing this in that moment, thought, hang on a minute. I recognise these individuals. I recognise them as the two men I saw when Kent was killed. Now, the defence, well, they argue, listen, Erickson could not possibly have remembered in detail what happened that night. He was far too intoxicated to remember any of the events. And Shauna and Jerry, well, hey, they're just mistaken about their identification of Ferguson at the crime scene. This is very common. People believe that they recognize somebody, but often it's a false memory 
or you start believing that the pictures that you see are becoming familiar to you and you start to place people at the crime. We've seen this again and again and again in criminal cases. So this eyewitness testimony that often people bet a great deal on, it's notoriously un reliable. To put this in context, we've done experiments where we create false memories in people's minds. We literally create them and then they believe them. There are so many research papers on this. It's actually quite terrifying because what you realize is every memory is a memory of a memory. So a story gets better in the telling is a saying. And of course it does because you know how people react to it. You learn the bits that make people laugh. You embellish the details that make it more dramatic. That's why a memory is often false. Doesn't mean you're a liar. It just means you've additionalized certain details and that makes it unreliable. Now, on top of this, the defense understandably is saying, listen, all of this stuff is very circumstantial to some degree. Yeah, we've got this guy saying, I definitely did it, and he's definitely my accomplice. But actually, when you add up the details that actually bring this to a position where we can consider this as fact, it doesn't make sense. There's literally no forensic evidence at all linking Ferguson to the killing. None of his fingerprints at the crime scene matched, nor did the hair found in the victim's hand. Now, I don't think any of us need to be a qualified and experienced investigator to say to ourselves, hmm, 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 hair in the hand of the individual who's defending themselves. Hmm, who would that hair belong to? Would it belong to a local cat? No, it wouldn't. It wasn't cat hair. It was human hair. Hmm. Who would that hair potentially belong to? I don't know, just throwing it out there, the perpetrator of the crime. Is it just me? I don't, it's just me. And it doesn't relate to Ferguson or Erickson. So the incriminating evidence, fingerprints and hair, yeah, absolutely no relationship to them. So the defense, they argue that there's sufficient reasonable doubt to justify an acquittal. Imagine being on the jury in that case. You've got these people who say, yeah, that's definitely the individuals that I saw that evening. Although we also have to additionalize that and say they didn't see those apparent individuals doing anything to the individual who's murdered. So even if they've seen or believe they've seen these people, that doesn't actually connect them to the actual crime. They didn't see the people attacking the individual who's killed. So. Their eyewitness testimony, you could certainly say there's reasonable doubt there. The forensics, one could argue it discounts the individuals who are actually standing trial altogether, but they also have to tally that with the fact that they have one of the perpetrators allegedly stating that he was present, stating how he carried out the killing and stating who his accomplice was. So therefore, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because on one level, it seems like there's absolutely reasonable doubt. You know, I'm listening to the evidence and the evidence itself, as in physical, that seems to be doubtful when you apply it to the individuals on trial. But then I listen to a person stating with conviction, we were definitely there and arguably that's powerful because that's a first person account of actually carrying out a murder. So even though the defense argue what I think is absolutely appropriate and effective that reasonable doubt exists and that an acquittal should take place, the jury have got a difficult job to do. When we get to the 18th of October, 2005, it's a day before Ferguson's 21st birthday. The jury find him guilty on second degree murder and aggravated robbery. Now, despite the fact that he was only 17, at the alleged time of his killing this particular individual, he ends up being sentenced to 40 years in prison. So he'd be looking at getting out at 61 years of age. His life would be a write-off. I mean, you can forget kids. You can forget a long-term partnership to some degree. You're a convicted felon of a horrific murder. And every opportunity that you were striving to create for yourself, 
just disintegrates and disappears. Now, before I move on, one of the things that I want to talk about is Kent, because Kent's been a completely innocent victim in all of this. We can say maybe it was a tragic case of wrong time, wrong place, a robbery turns into a brutal murder. And I suppose we can also say as far as people are concerned in the press and the family potentially, one of the killers has come along, done the right thing, confessed to the crime, and also because of that implicated his accomplice. Also, I suppose when it comes out in the press and when people who publicly judge these individuals think about the implications of the particular evidence, two eyewitnesses have positively identified them. So, so many people, in spite of what I've said about reasonable doubt and the defense have said about reasonable doubt, they think it's a concrete, absolutely watertight conviction. Bang to rights. One admitting he's there, the other denying it, but hey, a lot of people who are guilty deny that they're guilty. And also they've got witnesses and a statement of account of how the crime played out. People are satisfied. It had taken four years and that's four years too long, but justice had finally been done. Or had it? Or had it? Because throughout the trial, throughout the investigation per se, one of the things that is constant is Ferguson maintains his innocence. But it isn't just Ferguson who's looking at this case and thinking that this doesn't make sense. I mean, his family are 100% behind him. They know their son, they know their brother. As far as they're concerned, this boy is completely incapable of carrying out any kind of malevolent crime. But of course we could say, well, how many other families believe in the innocence of a loved one and actually they're entirely guilty? But you see, it's not just his family. In fact, there's a growing voice of support for this man. Lots and lots of different people feel that his conviction is due to a miscarriage of justice. And I mean, a big miscarriage of justice. And his case ends up catching the attention of Chicago attorney Kathleen Zellner. Wow. Let me just tell you now, if I was in a sticky situation, and I wanted justice and truth on my side, then Kathleen Zelma is who I would wish to have on speed dial. A dog with a bone does not do the description of her justice. They're the kind of individuals in this world that we want to hear about. They're the people that we can truly believe in. She's this high profile lawyer and her main work is working extensively in wrongful conviction advocacy. So her belief system is based in the moral and the legal desire for justice. And Zelna isn't some money thirsty individual who's just desperate to get in the media and put books in the bank. No. She took over Ferguson's case in 2009. She worked pro bono. She wasn't making a bean. All that mattered to her was justice. Now, by the time she takes on this case, and also I need to bring in the fact that the family are a big part of this. So Ferguson's father is a big driver in this seeking for justice. Not for a second did the family ever question their loved one's innocence. They knew. As far as they were concerned, they knew. So they're a big driver as well. But of course, Zelna is the big guns now. She is somebody who's desperate to get justice served. So even though he's been inside for five years, which must feel like an absolute endless lifetime, he does know that people are on his side. And I think psychologically for anybody who's wrongly convicted, they need to believe that there are good people out there doing good things for them. And fortunately for Ferguson, I think he has that bolstering, that knowing that these individuals are not going to give up on him. So she, first of all, starts to investigate the witness evidence, because bear in mind, this has been instrumental, basically, in securing his conviction. And what she discovered was absolutely shocking. So Zellner speaks to Erickson, Jerry Trump and Shauna Orned, because they're the three 
eyewitness testimonies in Ferguson's trial. And they all admitted to her that they had lied in court. And every single one of them pointed the finger of blame for this at one man, the prosecutor in the case, Kevin Crane. Just let that sink in, guys. Let that sink in, that the prosecutor had essentially led the witnesses to lie. And bear in mind, we have a young man serving a sentence of 40 years and they're admitting that they'd fabricated their accounts, all under the, shall we say, direction, if not insistence, of the prosecutor. Now, when police had actually originally arrested Erickson, when they interviewed him, he had made it 100% clear, and it is blindsiding to see this because, my God, he is very clear about this. He couldn't remember anything about the night that Kent was killed. In interviews, you see this. Even said, I could be making all of this up. It's like something got under his skin and he just couldn't get the ruminating thoughts and intrusive thoughts about the potential of being involved in this crime out of his mind. And so it becomes something that could be true. But he can't actually remember any details. Now, if you work in my field, if you're a psychologist, psychiatrist, or you're a therapist, you will understand intrusive thoughts. For those of you who don't know what intrusive thoughts are, some of you will, you'll suffer from OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And I'm not saying that this man was suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm saying that certainly some of the things that he describes about these thoughts, they tally with that kind of diagnosis. An intrusive thought, for those of you who aren't aware, wow, they are horrible, they really are. They are the worst things that you can imagine about you carrying out that come into your mind and almost challenge you to believe it. And you are the person who would never do any of these things, so it's abhorrent to you that you could even have these thoughts, and then you blame yourself and feel guilty and shameful for even having these horrible thoughts. The irony is the OCD individual dealing with intrusive thoughts would never act that way. That's why they're so upset by the intrusive thoughts. But if you imagine those thoughts playing in over and over and over again, you're not having support, you're not understanding them, and suddenly you're thinking, well, if I'm having all these thoughts and these thoughts seem to be repeating themselves, then maybe it's possible that I actually did this. And I think we can also acknowledge that there are lots and lots of cases of false confessions. Now, some of them are forced confessions, making them false. Others are, I did it. And actually the police investigate and realize there's absolutely no way on earth that this individual could ever have done it because they weren't even in the country, for example, or they had a solid alibi and it can't be disputed. They're caught on CCTV doing something else. But their belief system is, oh, I did do it. The mind can manifest the biggest myths and false memories are a part of that. And if you have somebody prompting you, if you have somebody furthering those, if you have somebody passing you details that could, shall we say, amplify and make those beliefs feel more concrete, well, that is dangerous stuff. So we see this young man, no idea of what went on on that night, doesn't even know whether he's making it up. And the detective gets right up into Erickson's face and he says it's his neck on the block and he says that Ferguson, Ferguson could not care less. So what he does is he carries out this really intimidating, threatening interrogation and it scares Erickson and he also fuels the flames of your friend doesn't care about you your friend's going to let you go down for this. Your friend's going to let you be the person who takes responsibility for this. And again, if you've got insecurity and fear, that's going to destabilize you without a doubt. Also, if that's not bad enough, and bear in mind, that is bad enough. We can all agree what I've just said is terrible. You know, you get somebody in here and they're saying, I don't even know whether I was there. I don't know whether I'm making it up. I don't remember any of the details. That's totally unstable. 
It's not a reliable witness. It's certainly not a reliable perpetrator. And it causes questions. And it's not going to be effective in front of any jury. Because if you're arguing, I don't know whether I did it, and actually there's nothing to tie you to the scene, well, basically, if you find somebody guilty on that level, it would show that the trial was an absolute joke because it would mean that the jury had so much doubt and yet still convicted. So from what he's testifying at this moment in time, there is no case to be had. But the investigators aren't happy with that. So during this process, obviously they're asking him questions about how the crime played out and also what Ferguson was doing. Just go with me on this. It's like, so tell me, how did Ferguson attack Kent? Oh, um, I don't, I don't, I don't really, I don't remember. Okay, we're just going to imagine that, you know, he's attacking Kent and he gets strangled. How did he strangle Kent? I think it was with a t-shirt? No, no, that's, that's not, that's not how he was strangled. Think again. I wonder if it was a bungee cord? Now I'm getting angry with you. I'm getting angry with you. It's not a t-shirt and it's not a bungee cord either. Can we guess again? Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something that involved a belt, for example. I think it was a belt that caused the strangulation. That is correct, it was a belt. We knew you were there. Seriously, I'm not exaggerating, guys. I am not exaggerating at all. So the police basically say that he's wrong on the two occasions where he's suggesting that he was strangled with other items, but then tells him that he was strangled with his own belt. So at this point, you would imagine Erickson to be like, Oh, okay, it was a belt. But actually what he says is, I have no recollection of that. I don't know why I'm doing a terrible American accent. I apologize in advance. But basically, even when he's told that it is a belt that's killed him, that's strangled him, he says, I don't remember that. He doesn't even remember it when he's fed the information. Well, again, this is sounding so unsafe, isn't it? So Zelda then inquires whether Erickson had actually noticed anything on his clothing the day after the killing. Had he got blood on it? He was like, no, didn't have any blood, didn't have any injuries. There was literally nothing unusual the next morning. Bear in mind, he's meant to have been involved in some violent killing, you know, where an individual has been battered beyond belief and he doesn't even have a stain on his clothing. Erickson then goes on to tell Zelma that he'd basically been threatened and intimidated by prosecutor Crevin Crane, and he'd also been pressured into implicating Ferguson. Now, in initial interviews with police, my God, Erickson could not have been vaguer. Honestly, I could have gone into that police interview and done a better job implicating myself. Seriously. All the police were missing out was a game of charades where they were literally like, three words, two syllables in the first word. You know, that's how desperate they were to get this guy to confess to details that he knew nothing about. In those initial interviews, the vagueness is unbelievable. He couldn't tell them anything about the murder. Ooh, but by the time he gives evidence at Ferguson's trial, surprise, surprise, could have wheeled out no more of a polished witness than he. He could describe in detail exactly what happened. He was able to recall events step by step. A little bit like if somebody made you rehearse the step by step by step. A little bit like somebody gave you a script with all the information and then practiced you with that script and information to a point where you had to remember just the information as opposed to the reality of the circumstances that really played out. So at this point, Erickson admits to Zelna he'd just been really scared by the police. They told him that definitely Ferguson was going to talk and that actually Ferguson was going to blame him full stop. Imagine that. You're in a situation where you've had these fears, these intrusive thoughts, you're psychologically in a vulnerable place and you don't really have the details about the crime but now you're being told, oh well you know what, the guy that you carried out the murder with, yeah, he's 
I'm going to say you did it. And now you're going to solidly want to make that into some kind of reality so that you can put the blame back on him or at least make him shoulder the blame at the same time. So he says at that point he created this story because he wanted to protect himself. And he tells Zelna he'd implicated Ferguson. But at this point, he says, actually, I realise on reflection, I was the only perpetrator. He said, I was the one who struck Kent. I was the one who strangled him. I did it alone. And he said Ferguson had actually been there with him and physically tried to stop him. And that until that point in his incarceration, he hadn't had the time to reflect. And now he'd got to this point of acceptance where the truth in his mind was clear. He was the killer. And Ferguson was an innocent party who'd actually tried to prevent the crime. However, when Zellner goes back and says to Ferguson, listen, we've had a real breakthrough. Erickson is saying, under no circumstances were you involved. Literally, you tried to prevent the murder and you are not part of this killing situation. He's willing to say that on record. Ferguson says, I know I'm not guilty because I wasn't even present. I wasn't at the crime scene. I'm not accepting just because he's saying I'm not guilty, but that I was still present, that version of events. It's not real. I was not there. And even more than that, I do not believe that Erickson is guilty. I do not believe that he killed Kent either. So we have to also think about Ferguson in this moment in time. You would imagine that he would have a level of rage and anger against his friend. Erickson could have been seen as Judas, a betrayer, somebody who had implicated him in a crime that he did not commit, someone who was then willing to fall on his sword and admit that he wasn't actually present, as in Ferguson wasn't present, and take the blame himself because he's had time to reflect. And you could imagine that Ferguson would be like, with my righteous rage, I will let you be the person who spends the rest of your life in prison because you have accepted full responsibility. But that's not how Ferguson operates. Ferguson does not believe his friend is capable, nor does he believe he is guilty, nor does he have the anger and the hostility that he would have a complete understandable reason to project towards Erickson. No. He believes that Erickson is also a victim of circumstance. Ferguson clearly has a level of sympathy and empathy for him, and that says something incredible about that young man. He certainly does not scream murderer by any stretch of the imagination. Now, meanwhile, she's also talking to other individuals who testified that they saw the two at the scene of the crime. So she speaks to Shauna Aunt. And she reveals that she told Kevin Crane that Ferguson was not the man that had been seen in the car park. He was not the man. Now, despite this, Crane had consistently and repeatedly tried to make her implicate Ferguson. According to Shauna, Crane had even been threatening in her last conversation with him. And I've looked this guy up because I don't know. I like to see the best in people. I like to imagine that there are redeeming qualities in every human being. I like to think that where justice is concerned, people care more about the law and justice than they do about their own reputation and winning. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm. Where Crane is concerned, ego is everything. What he cares about is ego. People seeing him as a winner. I don't think he cares about truth. I don't even know whether he would understand what truth is if it slapped him in the faith and he ended up with a massive tattoo saying truth on it that he had to look at every single day in the mirror. He probably wouldn't be able to spell it. Honestly, it's quite terrifying. But I swear to God, this guy still says they got the right guys. In spite of what I'm telling you now, in spite of the witnesses coming forward and saying they were basically coerced, forced or threatened, to give this testimony. If this guy's ego were to fall off his shoulder, it would certainly break both of his feet and probably go through a floor, maybe three or four different levels. But again, this is what gets me about corruption because it is endemic within so many of our systems that should be there to protect us. 
Now, according to Shauna, and certainly the testimony that was given to the police on the night of the killing, she said she got a really good look at the killers. When Crane was in court, he didn't ask her to identify Ferguson as the perpetrator. And the reason for this is she admits that she would never have been able to. And if she had never been able to, well, this would have massively damaged the prosecution's case. Also, turns out the bloody footprints, yeah, the ones that were at the crime, which would certainly be evidential of the killer being present and the killer wearing a particular type of shoe. And we know that shoes can be a little bit like fingerprints, not quite as precise, but certainly you can figure out because of the way that somebody's instep is and the way that somebody's gait is, that they define the way that the footprint is. And on top of that, actual soles of shoes often have particular types of sole that you can look at exactly what that shoe is. You would certainly imagine that the boy's shoes would have been looked at because clearly bloody footprints, you're going to imagine that their shoes are going to be evidential of that. But hey, the footprints were never even submitted as evidence by Crane. And the reason for that is they did not match Ericsson's or Ferguson's shoe size. Can you believe that? Can you believe that this information is withheld and that what we have there is an actual defining moment where the jury would have seen that somebody who was present, whose shoes were covered in blood, they didn't match the size of the individuals who were in court basically being charged with the crime. Now, on top of this, if it isn't incriminating enough what I've just said, when caretaker Jerry Trump, you remember the one who picked out the pictures in the paper because his wife sent them to him whilst he was in prison and just it jogged his memory. Yeah. When he was originally interviewed as a potential witness by the police on the night of the killing, he had said, listen, I didn't get a good look at them at all. I didn't see the two attackers in detail. Yeah. By the time that Ferguson's case gets to trial, whoo, Jerry's given completely the opposite description. Suddenly, he's got a really good look at the killers. He recognised their photographs. Remember, his wife sent him that newspaper. But the problem with his testimony is that Jerry's wife has got no recollection whatsoever of sending him a newspaper whilst he was in prison. The paper that had allegedly caused Jerry to recognise Ferguson and Erickson in the first place. And there was a really good reason as to why she couldn't quite locate the memory of doing that. It's because she'd never, ever sent that newspaper. So Jerry admitted that he'd actually been shown the article and the photograph of Ferguson by Kevin Crane, the prosecutor. The words diabolical just don't seem to fit this description of Crane enough. How harrowing. Could you be any more bent? I mean, genuinely, I asked that question. Could Kevin Crane be any more disloyal to justice and truth? And Jerry also admitted that he'd actually not been shown those photographs until 2004. That was in Crane's office after he'd been released from prison. Now, Crane had apparently said to Jerry, you know, it'd be really helpful if we could just identify Ferguson and place him at the crime. Really? No surprise there. What, so if you can get somebody to say, oh, I actually specifically saw that person and I locate them at the crime, that would be helpful, really? Really? Wow, that seems surprising. I cannot comprehend how she must have been feeling when she was investigating. For Zellner, a person who spends her time trying to restore justice, to be figuring that people who are meant to be on her side, advocating for it, are this corrupt, it must have left such a bad taste in her mouth. And if it wasn't bad enough that she's discovering all these things, she also discovered the prosecution had committed Brady violations, which means that the full disclosure of evidence had not been made to the defence. How can the defence have a fair trial if they're not even given the evidence? So one of those pieces of evidence concerned an interview with Jerry Trump's wife. So she told the police, I've got no recollection whatsoever of sending the newspaper to him in prison. Yet the transcripts of this interview hadn't been handed over to the defence team prior to the trial. Because if they had done that, 
it would have immediately discredited Jerry's evidence for prosecution. So they weren't even allowing them the actual evidence. And another failure that was failed to be disclosed by the prosecution, it concerned evidence that conflicted with the timeline that Erickson gave at Ferguson's trial. So Erickson testifies that after killing Kent, he and Ferguson had returned to the By George Club at around 2.45 a.m. He said, we left around 4 to 4.30 a.m. But the bouncer at the club had said the bar had closed at 1.30 a.m. And a customer had actually confirmed that Ferguson and Erickson had left between 1.15 and 1.30 a.m. Now, this conflicted with Erickson's court testimony because it suggested that the pair did not return to the club. And this obviously casts further doubt on the prosecution's claim that they had robbed Kent for beer money. The whole alleged reasoning behind the crime. And yet, it simply doesn't add up. Now, bear in mind, there's absolutely no forensic evidence against Ferguson. His conviction rested solely on the strength of damning eyewitness testimony. And all of that eyewitness testimony, it was all completely fabricated. They had been coerced and schooled and intimidated by prosecutor Kevin Crane. They were made to lie. They were made to sign statements that supported the prosecution case at the expense of Ferguson. So now, both Erickson and Jerry Trump, they make new statements recanting their testimony at Ferguson's trial. Now, armed with the new evidence that she needed, she so sorely needed, Zelna successfully won a retrial for Ferguson in 2012. And at the retrial, she called Michael Boyd to the stand. That was the last person to have seen Kent alive in the car park. However, even though he was the last person to have ever seen Kent alive in the car park, he'd never even been called to give evidence at the original trial. Boyd's account and the timeline that he'd provided had been crucial in the investigation against Ferguson and Erickson. However, Zelma questioned him in detail about this timeline. So he claimed that he'd left the car park at 2.20 a.m. Now, if you give that the killings must have taken between six to eight minutes to carry out, and an ambulance had then been called at 2.26 a.m., and at this point, poor Kent was actually dead, it actually placed him in the car park at the time of the murder. Also, a little bit concerning, turns out he'd given six conflicting accounts to the police. Meanwhile, and this is something that really resounds with me, and I'm sure it does with all of you, I'm sure when I described the killing earlier on, there were things going through your mind about a random robbery and how the synergy of expectation regarding how a murder is carried out really doesn't feel like it connects in the way that the murder actually plays out. Robberies don't tend to involve some of the elements that certainly Kent had suffered. So a pathologist cast doubt on the theory that the murder weapon had been a tire iron. He said, no, that would have caused school fractures. Kent hadn't suffered these fractures. Instead, he suspected it could have been a nail puller. Also, and this is the bit that really connects for me. He said, beatings and strangulation, they're just not typical in robberies. It's far more indicative of a murder that's caused by a relationship of deep animosity between the victim and the killer. So a sense of this feeling, emotion, rage, disdain, they're deep rooted their experience because of a relationship, not because of a random experience dealt out in a robbery. It doesn't make sense. Also, if it was a robbery, why was Kent's wallet not taken? It doesn't make sense. Now, in view of the false testimonies of the eyewitnesses, along, of course, with the repeated instances of non-disclosure of evidence by the prosecution. I mean, my God, if you are on a jury listening to a retrial and the defense are saying, hey, 
Do you know what the prosecution did? They recanted evidence so that we weren't aware of testimony that went directly against what my client was actually being considered guilty of. So he wasn't recognized by a witness. That never happened. So his trainers were the wrong size compared to the actual individual who we believe is the assailant. These are things that instantly I say, oh, hang on. If you're the prosecution and you've got a strong case, you don't need to be hiding this information or breaking an actual legislative piece that you cannot break in protection of justice. And yet they went ahead and did that. So that in itself is going to make me very mistrusting of the prosecution. And indeed it does because the court of appeals rule that Ferguson didn't get a fair trial. And actually in November, 2013, they vacated his conviction and every single charge against him, it was dismissed. The court was satisfied that clear evidence of his innocence had been provided. Now, on the 12th of November 2013, Ferguson was actually in prison. He was expecting a visit from his attorney and from his family. And instead, Zellner appeared at the window holding up a court booklet that had three words written on it. It is over. Can't even imagine how he would feel. Can you imagine? He'd been in prison for 10 years. He was released the same day, but 10 years. He'd been at a maximum security prison for a crime he didn't commit. One of the things that I would say, which is something that I don't think is talked about a great deal when it comes down to the incarcerated. Actually, when other prisoners believe that you are innocent of a crime, often you are given a far easier time in prison. And certainly I do believe that that plays out. I do believe that other prisoners felt that he was completely innocent and it was a miscarriage of justice. And I don't believe that his treatment in prison was terrible. So he has spent this awful decade knowing he was innocent. So he gets out and rightfully so in 2014, Ferguson files a civil suit against multiple defendants, including of course, former prosecutor. I use the words prosecutor very lightly because genuinely I see this man as a perpetrator of a crime. Kevin Crane may have been employed as the prosecutor, but for me, he is a perpetrator. He is a stealer of freedom. He is a liar, an intimidator, a coercer. He's despicable. He also pressed charges against 11 police officers involved in the case and the state of Missouri. Amongst other things, it alleged that false arrest, fabrication of evidence and malicious prosecution had occurred. I think we have covered all that in detail and we can all agree it's the case. And in 2017, he actually got awarded $11 million in damages, a million for legal costs and a million for each year that he had his freedom stolen. And it's such a satisfactory feeling knowing that when he got out, he made it his business to get justice for himself. And nothing will make up for those 10 years. I mean, they stole 10 years of his freedom, 10 years of his career trajectory, his relationship trajectory. He could have been married with kids and they took all that away from him for a whole decade. Now, not long after his incarceration, so this is going back to 2004, Ferguson had actually spoken with his father, Bill, and as I said, this family were such advocates. They really were. Their whole decade was spent basically imprisoned with their son and brother because they did not let up. They had no freedom while he had no freedom. But Bill is a very strong character. His father is a very strong character, the best kind of character. And he said, listen, you're going to be in here for a period of time. You've got to do whatever you need to do to survive in prison. In fact, he said, I know you're innocent, but whilst you're in there, I can't protect you. You have to do everything you can to make yourself stronger, faster and smarter to survive. Oh, it's heartbreaking for anybody out there who has children or has close relationships with a family member. You can just feel that, can't you? Having to have that conversation with somebody at your door and basically saying, I can't look after you anymore. You have to look after yourself and you're going to have to do whatever it takes to achieve that. And it's so powerful, but it's also so protective because it's the only thing that you need to know. 
how are you going to build yourself up? Because it's not just your mind, it's your body. You have to be ready for anything in these situations inside. And Ferguson went ahead and did it. He dedicated himself to exercise. He looks amazing. He's a really good looking guy, but wow, it's like those 10 years that he spent dedicated to creating a body that is enviable in every universe. It's really impressive. It's inspiring. So whilst he's in prison at Jefferson City Correctional Center, he even went and qualified as a personal trainer. Genuinely, considering he had 10 years inside, he came out looking astonishingly fantastic. And in 2022, so this is when he's been freed, he ends up as a contestant of season 33 of The Amazing Race, alongside one of his old friends, Dusty Harris. And in this reality TV programme, teams of two, they compete against each other in a race around the world. And Ferguson and Dusty, they had already been best friends prior to his imprisonment and he'd never lost that. Everyone knew he was innocent, but it was really important for him that they started to make up for the lost time. And they actually finished third, which is again, just so inspiring. I just love this guy. I love the triumph over adversity. I love the justice over deceit. Now I'm sure that there are questionable dealings that go on all the time. We talk about it on this channel. You know, things that go on between police, suspects, prosecutors in every jurisdiction across the globe, including in the UK. But the behaviour of the police and the prosecutor, Kevin Crane in this case, is deplorable. Deplorable. There isn't a word in the English language that I can find that can actually equate to the despicable behaviour in this case. But deplorable is the closest I can come to in expressing it. It seems that there was absolute clear evidence of police corruption and Crane was Mr. Coercion, Mr. Intimidation, Mr. Hiding Evidence, taking statements from witnesses that he basically demanded, fabricating a case around an innocent teenager with everything to live for, a pro-social individual who had never had a misdemeanor against his name and would likely never have had one against his name. This man concealed evidence that pointed towards complete innocence. He deprived that man, that young man, of a decade of his life, seemingly with no repercussions. What the actual F? That is appalling. And this guy, he is resolute in his willingness to just carry on saying he felt that a clearly innocent man was guilty. He has no shame, it's as simple as that. He's a horrible human being, genuinely. I would hate to be in his family because if you can be so deceitful when you're working in the course of justice, well, hey, I wouldn't want to be married to you, simple as. Now, I have no idea about Chuck Erickson's state of mind when he confessed to the police, but I have to suspect and certainly draw from my experience of working in this field, I think he was highly paranoid. I think he was highly vulnerable. He had issues with drink and drugs at the time. That was no secret. And it feels like the authorities absolutely hooked on this and used it to exploit him for their own ends. Now, following Ferguson's release, bear in mind Erickson remained incarcerated. Now, Ferguson, in spite of this, he actively campaigned for Erickson's release. Sorry, does it not just make you want to go? Can somebody award... Ferguson, some kind of humanity award. This young man is relentless in his desire to see justice served. He's out, he's free, he's living his best life. Everybody loves him, rightfully so. His body's incredible, he looks fantastic. People believe in him, he's got a great family. Could just have walked away and been like, Erickson, you caused this, you can rot in hell. No, absolutely not. Ferguson knows that as far as he is concerned, Erickson is absolutely innocent and he wanted him out. Now, despite Erickson's false testimony having been pivotal in Ferguson's original conviction, he fought for his friend to be released. Now, Erickson gets to the appeal of his conviction in 2018, but the appeal court turn it down. Why? Well, they say, listen, it's completely different. This guy fully confessed. He absolutely gave us the information that said there was a clear timeline and a clear confession that he took part 
in the commission of the crime and the murder. <laughs> Bear in mind, this is insane. I have no idea. Maybe Crane knew all the appeal court judges. Maybe Crane was that powerful that he could literally coerce individuals in power to just go along and be like, oh yeah, even though it's clear that this man was coerced into his actual confession, even though he was fed information, totally didn't have any awareness of how the crime had actually played out, had to guess games as far as figuring out how the guy was strangled. Even though all of that is absolutely clear, we're gonna say he's still guilty. Unbelievable. I mean, the confession was basically told to him. He then just gave it back to them verbatim. Now he only actually got released in January this year. He'd served 18 years of his 25 year sentence. I mean, on one level that makes me feel like at least he can have the rest of his life and hopefully he'll still get married, have kids, have a career and all the things that he deserves because at the end of the day, he should never have been in prison. And this brings us all the way back to the most important person in this case. We may not have covered him in great detail because obviously this is about a miscarriage of justice and how false memory and coercion in police interrogations can lead to mass miscarriages of justice, well, along with massively bent prosecutors. But we have to think about the family of Kent Heitholt. It's more than two decades after his murder and the case remains unsolved. When he was killed, he left behind a really loved and loving wife, Deborah, two teenage children, Vincent and Carly Rose. You can't imagine how they must feel, the betrayal they must experience on a daily level, knowing that individuals or an individual who murdered their father, their partner, their lover, their husband, they walk the streets freely. It would drive me to a level of desperation that I think would be incalculable and intolerable. And they don't deserve to suffer that. It was the police and the prosecutors outrageous handling of this case that has reduced greatly the likelihood of it ever being solved. And that means it's unlikely the true killer will ever be brought to justice. In the time that's passed, so much valuable evidence will simply have been lost. Now, there's been speculation around this. There's been speculation that Kent's colleague, Michael Boyd, may have been responsible for the murder. He was the last person to see Kent alive. And following the killing, he gave lots of conflicting statements to investigators. Even simple details were inconsistent. So according to Boyd's own testimony, he must still have been in the car park at the time that Kent was killed. Now, despite this, he's never even been considered a suspect. I don't get it. I can't say he's guilty. I'm saying, surely what you do is you discount suspects. You go through and you ensure that their actual statements tally with the reality of what's played out and you make damn sure that you test the evidence against them, such as fingerprints or what they're wearing on their shoes. Now, Ryan Ferguson, the hero in this story, and he is a hero in this story. He's 38 now and he works to raise awareness about his experiences with the justice system. And reflecting on his time in prison, he stated this. It really hurts to think about that. You try to avoid it, but it's impossible. I missed out on all my 20s and there's just no getting away from that. It's absolutely true, isn't it? I feel angry for him. I feel devastated that this young man and his friend, no matter how paranoid and delusional his friend was at the time, which led to the implication of him in this murder, I feel sorry for both of them. But for Ferguson, the man who stuck truthfully to the reality of what played out, it must have been absolutely astonishingly difficult and inhumanely at times difficult to actually manage the feelings that he emotionally had to deal with whilst knowing he was an innocent man incarcerated for 40 years. And again, just gonna throw it out there. I mean, what is this guy like? He's somebody who literally now wants to help others who are dealing with miscarriages in the justice system. I mean, you couldn't get a better human being. 
I will note as well that whilst we might be talking about this now as an isolated case, it's actually suspected that it really isn't. That Ferguson is just one of thousands of people potentially convicted and serving sentences for crimes they didn't commit. And this is brought fully into focus when we're dealing with characters like Crane, an individual who will intimidate, who will coerce, and who will fabricate for what? To win. Not about justice, not about the right person being condemned for the right crime, no. It's just about ego and victory. And Crane will not be the only one striving to protect their own ego over morality and justice. Let me know your thoughts about this case. Let me know your thoughts about Ryan in particular. I think he's testimony to the best in everybody. And it's also really important to bring in the family and of course the lawyer who pro bono ensured his freedom. It's one of those that leaves you with both a sour and sweet taste in your mouth because the right guy won in the end, but certainly there was a big cost. And also I think my sympathy and empathy really lies with Ericsson as well, an individual who should be treated correctly. There was something going on with him psychologically and he deserved the care and compassion. And that was sadly lacking. Join me again next time. I will be back as I am every single week, but let me know your thoughts. I appreciate them all. Remember guys, be safe.